No, no, you're right, Australian. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. Great to have you all here. Thanks for braving the crazy world that we live in and coming out tonight. If you've been watching the news, it's just getting worse and worse, isn't it? <laughs> the world has gone absolutely mad. Everything's in chaos. Uh, but we knew that was going to happen, didn't we? The Bible said things will get worse and worse, but Jesus has a plan. And that's what we've been learning about in these programs. And so I'm looking forward to, Gary, your presentation tonight, uh, hearing what the Bible has to say, God's plan for our lives, God's plan to solve this total mess that the world is in. So great to have you all here. And Gary, we look forward to what you have to say. Thank you. Good evening, everyone trust you've had yourself a good day today well we're going to get right into it this evening we're going to take an amazing journey to a few places tonight but I think before we begin tonight we need to ask God to help us all right let's do that father please help us to understand your word tonight as we visit the Middle East as we visit Jerusalem as we visit some of the places of the Bible lands may we understand where we are in the stream of time and what we, how we should live. Be with us tonight. May you be present with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, our first program tonight in this double series, double program, the Middle East at the crossroads, sin, sex and the Phoenicians. We're going to go to the Phoenicians first of all tonight. You probably noticed and Jared sort of indicated it to us, things are in a bit of a mess, aren't they, in some parts of the world. Uh, violence is increasing in our world. We mentioned that the other evening when I was in Sydney living there and uh, traveling on the trains. You very seldom would you see a train that wasn't graffitied. Uh, people don't respect other people's property anymore. Vandalism is on the increase. Uh, pornography is a billion dollar industry today. Um, and you, we wonder where are we headed? Think of child abuse. And uh, these problems that today kids face that we never had to face many years ago as much as we do today. Corruption and greed in political places and business today is universal. Face, the whole world faces these issues. When you think about it on these fronts tonight, it seems that we've lost our moral compass in the world. Things that were once rock solid what was right yesterday is wrong today and vice versa. Our morals are in great need of repair tonight. In fact, there are serious consequences to global lawlessness. Many people don't realise how dangerous this is. Sir Arnold J. Toynbee, British historian, Oxford University of London as well, this historian wrote a mammoth set of works about that long, <laughs> 21 uh, world civilizations he examined many volumes in his study of history as he was looking in his fifth volume he was asking the question why do uh, civilizations disintegrate and collapse through the ages why did the Aztecs collapse why did the Egyptian civilization go down how come the Babylonians went kaput why do the civilizations rise and fall what are the reasons that they disintegrate. He noticed about six factors, six reasons why they disintegrate. I want to bring to you number six reason. He called it abandon. What did he mean by abandon? Let's let him explain it. A state of mind that accepts antinomianism. That's a fancy word, isn't it? Anti is against, nomi or nomos is law, against the law. In other words, lawlessness. A state of mind that accepts lawlessness as a substitute for creativeness. You've probably seen that. If we can go against what the government says, what this person says, mum and dad said, that's creative. Well, there's some serious implications. Abandon or lawlessness, he noticed, was one reason civilizations down through the centuries have collapsed. And tonight, while we're sitting here, our world is on the tipping point. We if we go much further, we won't be able to bring it back, in other words. It's out of control almost. But thank God, in the book of Revelation, we discover a key to turn things around. I want you to notice it with me tonight. We began last evening, or yesterday afternoon, wasn't it, 
we saw these angels fly across the midnight heavens. John sees a dragon come up from the, uh, in, in his pages of his book. Then up he calls a sea beast. We're going to understand that next weekend. Then comes up a land beast and these three beasts together seek to control the world. So God sends three messages to counter these three. In the first message we began yesterday, I saw another angel. He's flying in the midst of heaven. There's no time to lose. He's in a hurry, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, saying with a loud voice. Now, we didn't look at this yesterday. We looked at another part. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Now, what does it mean to fear God? Does it mean to sit in a corner and bite your fingernails and be scared stiff or something? What does it mean to fear God? Well, number one, it means to take God seriously, to stand in awe of him. He's not the buddy next door. He's not Santa Claus. He's a holy, almighty, awesome God. That's the first thing it means, and the Bible tells us that. Let all the earth fear the Lord. What does that mean? He repeats himself, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. In other words, reverence and respect God. But secondly, it means have a deep respect with loving obedience toward God. The Bible says, what does the Lord your God ask of you? But to fear the Lord your God, and then he explains what that, what that means. To walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So this is what it means to fear God, to love him and respect him and stand in awe of him. So how do we fear God? How do we show that we fear God, I should say? The Bible tells us here, Moses is speaking, fear the Lord your God as long as you live, and then it tells us how, by keeping all his decrees and his commandments. Now, what commandments is Moses talking about here when he says that's how we fear God because that's what the world is called to do in the end of time? What commandments is he talking about? Well, we go to back to Revelation now. Notice what John sees. He sees the final events of planet Earth, the great events. Notice what John says. The nations were angry. He's talking of the end times. And your wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged it's judgment time and that you should reward your servants the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name John says we're down in the end of time the nations are angry the time of God's judgment has come and notice what he sees next then at that time when the nations are angry then the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. Now, let me share with you tonight, in our two programs tonight, you're going to get a key to help you understand the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. And that is about the temple. You see, you cannot understand the book of Revelation without having an understanding a little bit of the temple because there's so much language from the temple in the book of Revelation and Daniel. So tonight we'll get some, some tips on that as we proceed. So he sees the temple of God opened in heaven, and in that temple in heaven, he sees the Ark of his Covenant. Now some of you may have seen Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. I don't know if you saw that film. But what was Indiana Jones looking for, if you know something about that film, even if you didn't see it? He was looking for the Ark of the Covenant, remember. And he thought there was some sort of mighty magical powers in that thing. Great powers that emanated from this Ark of the Covenant. Well, it, Hollywood always gets it wrong, but at least he talked about the Ark of the Covenant. Anyway, let's go back to Sinai. You remember in reading in the biblical story of when Israel left Egypt, they came through the Sinai Desert. And while they were here, Moses came to Mount Sinai the Sinai mountain itself. This is the traditional Mount Sinai that many people climb. I've climbed it myself a few times. I remember the first time I went up there, I thought there was a motel up the top there. Uh, did I get that wrong? 
<laughs> it was just a little building up there no motel that's for sure and you freeze all night wake up every hour because you're freezing to death and then in the in the daytime you you cook it's a, it's a terrible desert that's what Moses said and he was up here for 40 days and 40 nights well it was up here on the mountain of Mount Sinai that he received what we call the Ten Commandments I'm sure we have probably all, all heard of them Hollywood made them famous Cecil B DeMille's blockbuster back there in the 60s I think it was he had a film called the Ten Commandments that Hollywood put out anyway Moses was given the Ten Commandments notice what the Bible says of this so he that's God he declared to you his covenant which he commanded you to perform and then he tells us what the covenant is that is the Ten Commandments and he wrote them on two tablets of stone now you know of all the words in the Bible these were written by human beings prophets but only these ten were written with the finger of God they must be important for God to write them himself he didn't let people write them he wrote them written by the finger of God and then they were placed in the ark or the box that's why it's called the ark of the covenant notice what the Bible says I will write on the tablets the words that's the Ten Commandments and you shall put them in the ark so it's called the Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of the Ten Commandments which is the covenant we just read that's what was in the box not some mighty powers in that box like dynamite or something it was the very words of God here and then they were placed in the temple that box so what's going on here in the book of Revelation center page John says he sees the final events of planet earth the nations are angry the time of the judgment has come when people will see the last empire and have that those things we talked about no death no pain no sorrow on those days when it's about to wrap up John sees the ark of the covenant in heaven's temple because he said the ark, the temple of God in heaven we read on the day of judgment so what's God doing here why does he give this picture in the middle of, of the book in the end times because God is calling the world's attention back to the Ten Commandments because God knows these can help us that's why he's doing it so the first thing about the Ten Commandments is this the Ten Commandments define and they protect our most important relationships in life that's what we're going to see this evening let's have a look at them the first four protect our relationships this way with God and the last six with our, our fellow human beings so let's read these commandments first commandment says you shall have no other gods before me this tells us a lot about God it tells us this God is a relational being he doesn't want anyone to come before him he wants us to put him first in our life now you wonder what sort of a God is that is he selfish or something no you'll see you'll see why God says put me first because it's going to help us with the rest of our relationships so God is a relational being he wants first place in our life I like this advert that someone wrote for sale fridge golf clubs used sofa 13 inch TV and other household gods they misspelt goods and turned their goods into gods you notice that and that's what we can do with our stuff our goods can become our gods can't they of course they can when you think about it we we may not worship idols of wood and stone today but we have many other idols that sometimes are more important to us than God for example many people have an idol it's called the sport idol they will go and worship in their temple every Saturday or Sunday afternoon watching the, the game right but have no time for the God of heaven this becomes more important to them than God you see it can be many things we have rock idols all sorts of idols today we even call them idols don't we or stars they become more important to us many people than God God says don't put anything in before me make sure you put me first number two commandment you shall not make for yourself a carved image any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath 
or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Let's just push the pause button there. That word jealousy is a love word, right? Now, if, I, if my wife found out in Hobart that I was making ice with some of the women here in Brisbane, she would get jealous because I belong to her. She belongs to me. That's a love word. God says, when we worship other gods, it breaks his heart. He gets jealous. Let's continue on. I visit, I punish the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but show mercy to thousands who love me and keep my commandments. What is this telling us about God? Number one, he's a God of loving relationships, not just relationships, because you can have all sorts of relationships, can't you? But he is a God of loving relationships. You see, love must have a, it's like a two-sided coin. It must have two things. Love must be merciful to be loved and kind, but it also must be just. You see, if the government is a good government, but it lets the rapists do what they want to do and it lets the murderers do what they want to do, is that loving? No, of course not. People need to have justice in order for us to express love. Love has a, is like a double side. God is both just and he's merciful. He has to be both in order to be loving. So that's the sort of God we have. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. What is this saying? Well, it's not saying just because you banged your finger with the hammer and you let out a word and used God's name. Well, that's part of it, but that's not the real thing. It means this. God is a God of integrity. What God says he is, he is. God is full of integrity. A beautiful thing to have a God who is what he says he is. You know, what God is also saying is, when you take my name, when you say I'm a follower of God, but we don't live like God, so we might come here to church, say, but we beat up on our kids big time at home, or we beat up on our wife, or we're unfaithful to our spouse, but we say we love God. God says, come on, give it a break. It's taking my name in vain. You're saying you're my follower, but you don't live like one. That's really what God is talking about. Like masks that we wear. I, I sadly have seen where Christians go to church one day a week, but on Monday morning, they rob Hindu temples, not Hindu temples, Hindu homes. How do you think the Hindus feel about the God of heaven? Not too good. They're not impressed with, with a God whose people rob them. That's the point we're making here. If a person says he's a follower of God, then God says, live like one, be one. Very important. God says, don't take my name in vain. Number four commandment is a beautiful commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. Why? For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. This is a beautiful commandment because it tells us a lot about God. It says God is a true father friend. He's called our maker here, you notice. In fact, the Bible says that you and I were made in the image of God. What a tremendous privilege. We are made in the image of God. And God says, listen, I want you to take a whole day with me. You think about it. It requires time to build relationships. That's one of the reasons that the home is disintegrating today because husband has two or three jobs, the wife has two or three jobs, the kids are on the run, and so often we don't really connect together. And that's why marriages are crumbling often. You kids, you know, you think about it, young people. You got Mr. Nice or Mrs. Nice, you know, you're trying to make a relationship with him, you ring him up on telephone once a month, how long are you going to get a relationship going like that? You've got to spend quality time together to build a relationship, don't you? Well, it's the same with us and God, God is saying. You are my children. You are my friends. Spend time with me. I'm going to give you a whole day, and I'm going to take the day off so we together we can really connect. What a God. That's the God who's running the universe. So the first four commandments protect our relationships with God. Why does God say, put me first? Here's why. If you put God first in your relationships, 
then all your other relationships will last. That's why God says that. You see, I can't say, man, I love you, God, but I'm going to cheat on my wife. Because I know if I do that, I can't connect with God. It just doesn't work like that. I can't say, God, I love you, but I steal your stuff. It just doesn't work like that. When we put God first, then we follow what God says when it comes to people. That's why God says, put me first. And that's, by the way, why our civilization, as Jared said tonight, is falling apart. Because we have forgotten God. And when we forget God, we will mistreat other people. Don't, don't worry about that. That's what will come out of it. And that's why the world is in a mess, because we have forgotten God. Now, the last six commandments protect our relationships with other people. The Bible says, honor your father and your mother. Man, what a God this is. God is selfless. He shares respect with others. Our parents procreated us. God is the creator of all. But because our parents brought us into the world, God says, honor them. Now, you may not have had a good mum and a good dad, but you can be thankful for them for one thing at least. You're here. <laughs> Thank God for that. God says, honor your parents, honor your parents. The most basic of human relationships is the family, the home. And that's one reason why the world is falling apart, because when society has homes that crumble, society crumbles, because that's what society is built on, the home. And that's why the home is under attack tonight by the devil. So God's commandments protect the family. Commandment number six says, you shall not kill. This tells us that our God values everyone by none. Every single person, whether you're rich or whether you're poor, whether you're smart or whether maybe you don't have so much endowed with, with, with the ability to think like other people, everyone is important. Every single person is valuable to God. That's why God says, don't kill. God's commandments protect human life. You shall not commit adultery. This says to us, God values faithfulness. God values faithfulness. Now maybe in your life, divorce has come. We understand these things happen. But young people, tonight, before you get married, think well before you choose. Pray to God. If you've been praying now, pray more when you choose a partner. And if your marriage tragically has fallen apart, and it is your fault, maybe, ask God for forgiveness. He will forgive and move on. Sometimes we can't unscramble scrambled eggs. We can't do that. We must move on. But we must remember, marriage is by God for life. That's the ideal. The Bible says, until death we do part. But unfortunately, in recent times, it's become until we do part. I don't like the old model, not as pretty as she was. I'll go for another model. You know, that's the way it goes today. He doesn't look so good as he once looked. Well, maybe there's another better guy somewhere. God says, no. Because let me tell you what happens. I've seen it again and again as a pastor. The big losers in this are the kids. And not only the kids, but it hurts us. The husband or the wife. Everybody's a loser. And so God says, do not commit adultery. Jesus said adultery includes to lust after a woman. Let me talk to you men. One of the greatest problems in the world today is pornography. And God says, listen, don't do it. Guard your eyes. You see, what does your wife think? If you're looking at the body of another woman, she doesn't feel too valued. Man, this is a problem. You, wherever we go in the world today, let me say, you, you cannot escape it, but you can turn away. You can refuse to look. And we must refuse to look. Because if we don't, it will wreck our, our families. And too many homes have been wrecked by this thing. And the devil knows how to catch us, guys. So Jesus said, whoever looks at a woman to lust after her, even before he goes to bed with her, he's already committed adultery in his heart. So let's remember what Jesus said. God's commandments protect the marriage and the home. But it also protects our health, this commandment. Because I was very fascinated, well, not fascinated, distraught, I guess is a better word, to notice this, Sydney Morning Herald, venereal disease among young Australians has skyrocketed, prompting a warning from health officials that HIV infection rates could also rise. 
the number of chlamydia cases doubled to 60,000 over the four years to 2008. That's 2008 now, we're beyond that now, of course. Federal government figures reveal people aged between 20 and 29 are the group at highest risk. Whoa! You know what? Why is this the case? Why are we having more sexually transmitted diseases today? Because we've forgotten this commandment. And the reason is, is we initiate sexual intercourse early, globally around the world. One third of all new cases of sexually transmitted diseases are under 25. Around the world. We marry late. So that means we have more sexual partners before we choose one. Or the first one. Not only that, but we divorce often, so we have more partners, so we put ourselves more at risk. We, in fact, you know, in Australia, we average seven, 13 sexual partners in Australia in a lifetime, in our country. In New Zealand, sorry Kiwis, New Zealand women are the highest in the world, 20.4 sexual partners in a lifetime. And the men, 16.8 in that country. And we're not, we're not far behind, let me tell you. Now that's one of the reasons why we're, we're facing these issues, of course. Number eight commandment, you shall not steal. God values honesty. When you stop and think about what a God this is, what a world this would be if we followed these things. God values honesty. You see, what your, what's yours is not mine. God's commandments protect our possessions. And that's very important to God. God says also, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Commandment number nine. What's he saying? He's saying, don't lie. God values truthfulness. You see what's going on here? At the bottom of all relationships is trust. And if people can't believe what we say, they can't trust us. If people can't know that we, we, we don't honor their stuff, but we'll take what's not ours, they can't trust us. And then relationships fall apart, you see. Look, this was shocking. I, I travel, uh, when I was living in, in Sydney on the north coast, uh, sorry, the central coast of New South Wales there, I used to travel every day by train and every, way, every day on the way home you get this magazine called MX Magazine. And I noticed on MX Magazine one day this shocking statistic. One third of Australians lie to get a job. Whoa, we're a bunch of liars. Well, down in Sydney anyway, <laughs> not up in Brisbane. <laughs> Think about it. Oh, it's only a white lie to get a job. But no, it's a lie. And if we, if we do that, people can't really trust us. If we lie to get a job, how can they trust us really at work? When we begin that way, that job. No, God says, be honest. God's commandments protect our reputations. We can destroy people just by our gossip. Because that's what gossip is. It's not necessarily the truth. And people will do all sorts of things to others to climb up to get above their position or to get their position. You've seen it take place in the corporate world, takes place at school, takes place in sport. Someone wants to climb, so they'll say things that are not quite true about other people. Last commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor anything that is your neighbor's. In other words, God values contentedness. We don't have to look at what others have got because when we do that, we get discontented. Be happy with what we've got, God is saying. Just be content with what you've got. God provides our needs. He does. He really does. But no, this is the way we is. Our friends have got it. We've got to have it. Fashions, for the guys, we've got to have the latest gadgets. Got the latest iPhone? Well, you're behind, man. You need to catch up. You know, this is the way we go. Television advertising, or the advertising industry itself, thrives because people break that commandment. Trying to sell stuff that we don't need, really need. And uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't advertise, but sometimes it's, it's just because uh, they're pampering to our own lack of contentedness. You see, God's commandments, this one, protects our mental and emotional well-being. That's what God is doing here. Be content with what we've got. What a God. No wonder Billy Graham, that great preacher, said these words when he was talking of the Ten Commandments. God's law, and he's talking of the Ten Commandments, it's never 
out of date imagine what Brisbane would be like if we all lived by that I tell you what the cops would be out of the job for sure wouldn't they for starters there'd be a lot of things that would change in our cities around Australia if we followed these 10 principles it's the law of love love to God love to other people that's how we show our love so the Ten Commandments first of all define and protect our most important relationships but there's a second reason God brings the Ten Commandments to the fore in the end of times and that is this the Ten Commandments reveal or point out our sin or our wrongdoing they're very good at that the Bible says so notice what the Bible says here what shall we say then is the law sin certainly not he says on the contrary I would not have known sin except through the law for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet the commandments you see are like a mirror here's a woman she's looking at her face in the mirror and she sees there's dirt it's the mirror that points the dirt out can she get rid of the dirt by rubbing the mirror over her face well of course not she has to go to the wash basin it's very good at showing us our dirt but it, it can't get rid of it just like a mirror can't but it can tell us where we need some help so it reveals the dirt of sin now let's come to sin for a moment very little word but man what is sin think about it now everyone who sins breaks the law God says in fact sin is lawlessness that's God's definition of sin it's breaking the Ten Commandments or the law of God now remember the Ten Commandments define and protect our most important relationships in life so if sin is breaking the commandments what really is sin all about sin is about breaking relationships the big deal about sin is not what I do or what I don't do so much it's who I hurt and we usually miss that point sin when I sin somebody gets hurt some relationship is broken that's why Isaiah gave this relational portrait of sin notice what he wrote about the Israelites but your iniquities that's a fancy word for sin have separated you from your God sin breaks relationships with God here he says what have they done your hands are defiled with blood you've been murdering people your fingers with iniquity you've been stealing stuff your lips have spoken lies your tongue has muttered perversity now think about Jesus on the cross when Jesus went to the cross we saw the last couple of programs he took your sin he took my sin he took the sin of the whole world and so what did he cry out when he was on the cross my God my God why have you forsaken me you see sin separated him from God as it were he felt forsaken he felt abandoned because he was carrying our sin because that's what sin does that's why Jesus said these words if you love me you will keep my commandments the commandments are about relationships you see about protecting those relationships now it was Christ who wrote the Ten Commandments because he just said if you love me keep my commandments he's saying I was the commandment giver that's why Paul says when he talks about Israel wandering through the desert he says then remember that rock that they got water out of that rock that rock he says was Christ because he was the one wandering through the desert with them he was the one that gave the law on Mount Sinai the pre-incarnate Christ so the Bible says he who says I know him meaning I'm his friend and does not keep his commandments he is a liar and the truth is not in him my friends you and I can claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ but if we don't keep his commandments when we know what we should do we won't do that we're just lying whoa that's a pretty serious business we can all fall into that trap if we're not careful no Jesus says if you love me then you will keep my commandments so sin is about breaking relationships when I sin I hurt someone or that we would think about that more often there was a young boy in India in the backyard of their home he was put in charge of the goats on this particular day and the goats were playing up like goats do often and he picked up his bush knife you know bush knife 
handle like that, knife like that, blade like that. And he flung it at the goat out of anger because he was so cross with the thing messing up. And he missed the goat, hit his sister and killed her on the spot. Now that's what happens when we sin. Sin is called in the Bible missing the mark. And when we miss the mark, somebody gets hurt. Somebody is in the crossfire, crosshairs. That's the tragedy about sin. That's why it's so serious. Because when we sin, we hurt someone. Now, is breaking the Ten Commandments that much of a deal, really? Is it that big of much of a deal? Well, I want to come to Israel now. Sadly, the Israelites who were given first given written, the written down commandments, and God wrote them down for them, they existed before, of course, but he now wrote them down for Israel on Mount Sinai. Sadly, they turned away from the Ten Commandments themselves. I want to bring you to a place in Syria called Rashamra. In ancient times, it was called Ugarit. The archaeologists were excavating here. This is Canaanite country. You'll understand why God said, don't practice what the Canaanites practice. Don't do that stuff. You'll see why in a moment. So the archaeologists, especially the French, excavated in the Canaanite cities. And when they excavated these places, they found some of the Canaanite gods and what they got up to. Baal was the great god of the Canaanites, right in the middle there. You probably can't see it, but here's his club up here. He's just his hand holding the club. And he's the god that makes the thunder and brings the rains and, 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 and makes everything grow. He's the god of fertility. But he has a couple of ladies in his life. One, his wife, Asherah, happens to also be his sister. You see, the Canaanites were into incest. Well, that's one of the reasons God says don't follow their practice. He also has another lady in his life, this lady here, Ashtati. She's a very seductive, lustful goddess. Ashtati is known as Tanit to the Carthaginians. You see, let's come to Carthage. The Phoenicians, the Canaanites who lived on the coast of Israel and Palestine before the Israelites came in, those Canaanites were called Phoenicians. And the Phoenicians, living right on the edge here, they were sea traders. We saw last yesterday they lived in Tyre. That's a Canaanite Phoenician city. Well, they sailed all around the Mediterranean. They had colonies in various places. Well, one of them was right here in North Africa, in Tunisia. You can visit it today. We were there last year with a group. Now, when you visit Carthage, you notice this is a colony of, as we said, the Phoenicians. And archaeologists digging in Carthage discovered a Tophet. Now, what's a Tophet? Well, a Tophet is a place for child sacrifice victims. Little children who have been killed as human sacrifices. This Tophet is a very large one, 6,000 square feet. The, the archaeologists discovered that there were some 20,000 victims of human sacrifice here, between 400 to 200 BC. In fact, when the Romans came to Carthage, they had their wars with the Carthaginians, they were abhorred by the practice that the, of human sacrifice that these people got up to. Now, under each of these stele, you notice these stones. These are stele, like a tombstone, if you would, not, but that's what they sort of are. Under each of these was this little pots. And inside those pots, these urns, there were the charred bones and teeth of little children who had been burnt to death. How did they do it? They had these great big gods made of metal, and they would have a fire lit inside the back of these things and they'd, they'd be red hot and then the priest would come along and place the baby in the arms of that God and of course it would be killed in fact we, you have an, we have an inscription of a priest carrying a little baby to do that very thing now th this was Canaanite worship not only was this part of the practices of the Canaanites but they had temple prostitutes Male prostitutes for the ladies, female prostitutes for the men. When you go to the temple, that's what you do. Now, tragically, the Israelites got into this, especially it began or continued big time when Ahab was an Israelite king. He married a Phoenician princess by the name of Jezebel, and she brought with her into Israel all her religion, including Baal and Asherah and so on. And as time went on, the Israelites practiced human sacrifice, even some of the kings. This was a tragic thing. But right here in the valley of Ben-Hinnom, uh, in Jerusalem, this is where they set up a Tophet themselves. Kings like Ahaz and Manasseh practiced human sacrifice on their kids. 
They have built up the high places of Topheth in the valley of Hinnom to burn their sons and daughters in the fire, the Bible says. Jeremiah is writing. Now you imagine what this did for, for the society. So you go to the temple. You go with your wife to the temple and, and she goes one way, you go the other way and she comes home and you come home and say, well, I had sex today with a, this guy and I had sex with this, this lady. I mean, what would that do with the marriage? Come on now. You see what's going on here? You see why God said don't get into this stuff? And then one day dad goes to the temple and he doesn't come back with a little boy. Where's the boy? Oh, I killed him down the temple. The priest killed him down there. He's gone. I mean, just how imagine how the home was. Now I hope we can see why sometimes when God says things, we now understand why he said these things. Because these things were ripping the heart out of the lives of the people. Tragically. Well, sadly, Israel did not listen. And so what? Well, for centuries, God sent prophet after prophet after prophet. You read it. You read all these prophets. You wonder what these guys are up to. I'll tell you what they're up to. They're calling Israel back to the Ten Commandments, which will protect them if they only follow them. But they will not listen. And so God says, all right, that's what you want. I'll let you have your choice. And so the Assyrians come down. We saw who they were the other night. No mercy from the Assyrians, I tell you. Skin you alive, we saw. And they destroyed the northern kingdom. And then God gave another hundred years for the southern kingdom, Jerusalem and Judea, Judah. Sent prophets like Jeremiah. But they would not listen. They got worse and worse. And finally God says, all right, the Babylonians will come. And so the Babylonians come. And they destroy their city. And they cart them off to Babylon. And some of those kings, their eyes were put out by the Babylonians. It's a terrible picture, you see. But you see, breaking God's commandments breaks us in actual fact. Now Daniel is in Babylon because of what Israel has done. He's there. Even God's faithful people had to suffer. They were in Babylon too. Daniel's down in Babylon. He's reading the book of Jeremiah. He realizes time is up. It's God promised to bring us home again. So he goes to his knees to talk to his God. And in the middle of his prayer, I want you to notice what Daniel said. What had happened? Why are we in this mess? Notice what he says. We have sinned. All Israel has transgressed. It means broken your law and has departed. See, they separated themselves from God so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the Lord God has kept this disaster in mind and brought it upon us. You know, Sir Arnold J. Toynbee, he studied those 21 world civilizations for many years and he, decided, he discovered that one reason is lawlessness leads to destruction. Well, thank you, Sir Arnold J. Toynbee, but Daniel told us that five, 2,500 years ago. You see, Daniel already told us that. The Bible says, and my friends tonight, we need to turn back to God. Because when we fail to follow what God says, we're only ruining ourselves and our families and so on. So what did we break the commandments today? God tells us, is it really that big a deal? Yes, it is. The wages of sin is death. That means eternal death because he contrasts it to the gift of God, which is eternal life. It's, it, it leads to eternal death, eternal destruction. What a tragedy. No wonder God tells us these things because he loves us. He doesn't want us to go into destruction like the Israelites did. For 300 years or more he warned them. Now, the last thing about the Ten Commandments, why God brings them out in the end times, is because they're going to be the standard in God's judgment in the end of time. John, as we saw, sees earth's final events. The time of the end has come. The nations are angry. Let's read it again. The nations were angry. Your wrath has come. And the time of the dead that they should be judged. It's judgment day, in other words, for the world. Earth's judgment day has come, says John. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen. Why did John see the ark of the covenant on judgment day? Because the Ten Commandments... God is calling our attention to them because these are going to be the standard in that judgment. That's what God is doing. Notice what James says. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. What's the law of liberty? James tells us in a previous couple of verses. 
For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. You know, the Ten Commandments are the law of liberty. Ask that to a person who's gone to jail because he's murdered someone. Is he free to do that? No, not when he's behind bars for many years. Ask the person who's got STDs because they lived an immoral life. And is it free to do to break God's commandment? No, it leads to tragedy. It leads to suffering. You see, God's law is a law of liberty. It will help us, in other words. It will protect us from those things which would harm us. That's why God's given it to us, because he loves us. The law of liberty, the Ten Commandments. Now, what's the solution for breaking God's law? Because we've all done it. We really have. Number two, what's the solution for restoring our broken relationship with God? Because we broke his commandments. What's the solution for obeying and following God's laws? Because we love him. How can you do that? Fourthly, how, what's the solution for finding favour in God's judgment? Because we're going to be judged by those. What's the solution? That's where we want to wrap it up tonight, our first one. Well, it's the gospel of God's grace. The gospel of grace is the solution. Because you see, grace changes our lives from the inside out. It makes us new people. I want you to notice what the Bible says. We read now in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews this is the covenant that I will make says the Lord I will put my laws in their minds and I will write them in their hearts in other words they will just that'll be just part of them they will love to do it in other words and I will be their God and they shall be my people all shall know me they'll have a relationship with me in other words from the least of them to the greatest of them, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds, he says, I will remember no more. Notice the, co the covenant. God says it's made up of three things. Number one, forgiveness of sin. You and I have done wrong, God forgives us. Number two, we are brought back to God. That's part of the covenant. Number three, God's law. In us, a new power, of, a new life of power becomes ours. How does it all come? The same book says these words, Now may the God of peace, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will. It's the death of Jesus. That's the way to have God's laws written in our hearts and lives. That's the way to be forgiven for breaking them. That's the way to be ready to stand in God's great judgment and John saw God's people in the end of time as we go to the middle of the book of Revelation we notice there's a big fight coming we're going to talk about those three beasts next weekend very clearly three three beasts seek global control that battle starts with a very important verse this is the verse the dragon was angry with the woman he went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. These are followers of Jesus. They keep his commandments. When that battle ends, in, the, in chapter 14, as we're going to see, it ends with this verse. Notice the last verse of that battle. Here is the patience of the saints, God's friends. Here are those who keep the commandments of God, and they have the faith of Jesus. You see, it's Jesus uh, that gives to us a love that obeys God. It's Jesus, because of his death, who forgives us. This is how it is. I want to close with you to meet my friend, Alex Fafale. I met Alex when I was running the series like this in the Sonoma Islands in Honiara. Alex has got two things. You notice them? Big scar, big smile. <laughs> That's Alex. Big scar, big smile. Let me tell you how he got both of those things. Alex grew up in a Christian home, but he left his God behind. When he grew up, I don't need God. And so Alex just did what he wanted to do. He became a heavy drinker. And when Alex got drunk, he got violent. He went to jail four times. First time, he nearly killed a man when he was drunk. Second time, same thing. Third time, I've forgotten what that was, but I'm sure it was the same thing, knowing Alex. Fourth time, he took on the police in the ANZ Bank in Honiara, and he got four years for that one. He's in jail the fourth time, and he hears that his wife has had an affair with another man, and she's carrying that man's child. He is not happy. Alex comes out of prison, 
goes straight to his house. He's sitting in his lounge there in, in Honiara, in his home in Solomon Islands, and a voice spoke to him out loud. Alex, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now Alex had grown up as a Christian. He knew some of the Bible and he knew God was speaking to him with those words. So right then, Alex just got down and said, oh God, help me, my life. I need you in my life. And God came into Alex's life right then and there. Just a few days later, he's with his wife in the market. He sees Mr. Boyfriend. He grabs hold of his wife's hand and he runs over with his wife to that man and he grabbed hold of his hand and he started praying with the three of them. And he said, I started praying, oh God, please forgive my wife and forgive this man. And as he's praying, he said, another voice spoke to him, kill him. You know whose voice that was? <laughs> Alex said, I kept praying because if I had to stop praying, I'd kill the guy. And when that prayer was finished, there was a beautiful reconciliation between three people. That's what Jesus can do, my friend. Jesus has the power to change things in your home, in your life. Well, a few days later, he's, some time later, he's down in the market, same market, saw the man who gave him the big scar across his head. So he ran over to them and he grabbed that man's hand. I mean, Alex is just different. He grabbed hold of that guy's hand. He said, that guy started to tremble like a leaf. He thought his days were done. And Alex said to him, he said, don't be afraid. Jesus is my friend and now you're my friend. You see what happens when Jesus comes? The violent become calm. The impure become pure. God forgives and God writes his laws on our hearts. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for the commandments. So often we've looked upon them as restrictions. But that's totally the devil's trap. These were given by a loving God because he wants to help our life. But thank God that through Jesus, he writes those laws in our hearts and minds. And if tonight you'd like to say, oh God, write your laws on my heart and forgive my stuff because I've broken them, but I want Jesus, just raise your hand tonight just to tell God, oh God, I need your help. I want Jesus. Change me. Thank you, God, that you see our hands. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jared. Well, with all that good food, you mustn't go to sleep now, okay? <laughs> That's the danger after some food, isn't it? All right, now we just want to bring one thing to your attention. Um, because of the coronavirus problems, it's, uh, we don't know what's going to happen from day to day, all right? Our plan is, is to keep going the way we are, uh, but if something happens and we have to shut down, then we will continue by live streaming, okay? So make sure you leave us with your email address because if something goes wrong, we need to contact you. Your email address or your address, if you don't have an email, um, let us know so that we can let you know what's happening, okay? Um, so you'll be able to watch via live streaming if something, if it turns out to that. We don't want that to go that way, but that's what we'll have to do. We want to keep the program going because the, the prophecies are so vital, aren't they? And uh, God is so good to give us these things. All right, now we're going to go to the uh, Dome of the Rock building now. S back in the year 2000, some of you may recall when Ariel Sharon, the Prime Minister of Israel, decided to walk up onto the Temple Mount where this Golden Dome building is. And tragically, because of that little stroll up to that mount there, that uh, golden dome, he caused what is called the Second Intifada. That means a great fight, if you will, between the Palestinians and the Jews. It cost the lives of 3,000 Palestinians when the Intifada was over, and 1,000 Jews were killed. Uh, Israelis, yes, were killed. So the question we want to answer tonight as we begin is, why did he come up here? Why did he put so many lives at risk by coming up to this building, this site? And why did it upset the Muslims that he came here? We'll answer those questions as we proceed through this next session. Abraham was able to get front cover story on Time magazine once. 
Uh, there he is, Abraham. He was that great father of the Jewish nation. He came from here in Ur in Iraq. Ur is near the Gulf, uh, the Persian Gulf. And Abraham, when he was here, was called by God to leave his country. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says these words. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now I want you to notice God gave, made, gave prom three promises to Abraham here. Three things he gave him or told him he would, uh, he would do through Abraham. Number one, he gave him a special place, a piece of land, some real estate. That's pretty important to many people, isn't it? No matter what culture, land is important. That land eventually became what we call Israel today. That was the land God gave him. Why this piece of land? Why not Australia or some other place? What was the reason for this piece of land? Well, when we go to the map, of the Mediterranean region you will notice here this is the Mediterranean Sea here is Egypt a great civilization as we've talked about over here Mesopotamia the believed to be the cradle of civilization from here people went to China and so on India and then of course over here was Turkey and further Greece and then Europe this was right smack bang in the middle of the world of those times you see Abraham left Ur traveled up through Mesopotamia and then came down. You wouldn't go across this way because this is desert. Can't bring your family that way. They'll die before they get too far. So that's the way he would have come. And he lands up right in Jerusalem or in Israel. And that gives him global reach because it's right in the middle. If someone's coming up from Egypt, they're going to go through Jerusalem and so on on their way to Mesopotamia. They're going to come through that land. If they're coming from Mesopotamia down to Egypt, another great civilization, they're going to pass through there. If they're going to go up to Turkey from Egypt, they're going to go that way. So this was a very strategic place. That's what God says. Thus says the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set her in the midst of the nations and the countries all around her because God wanted to communicate we're going to see with others. Number two, God gave Abraham a special people, a great nation, he said. That nation became what we call Israel. Now, these people were to be great if they followed what God said. They would to reveal God's love by their life. That's what God gave them, the Ten Commandments. Because by keeping God's commandments, people would say, wow, they're nice people, you know. We're attracted by people who are good people, are we not? Yes, we are. People who are nice and kind and gentle and generous, we're attracted to them. What makes them tick? So that was God's plan. That's what he says in the Bible here. Also today, the Lord has proclaimed you to be his special people, just as he promised you, that you should keep all his commandments. That's what would make them special. They would be good people, loving relationships with God, and other people as we've just seen therefore God said be careful to observe them that's the commandments for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes or laws and say surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people wow you guys are so lucky to have laws like that we wish we had them how do we get them that was the idea, because that made them a good people. Thirdly, they were to have a special purpose, because people would be attracted to them, and then they could share something with them. What was it that was going to be so special in terms of the purpose? Their purpose was to bless or to help the rest of the world. They were not just for themselves. They were to be a help to the rest of us. The Bible says, He said to me, Isaiah is talking, you are my servant, talking of Israel. O Israel, you are my servant. I would also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. That's what their purpose was, to help the rest of humanity. 
How would they do that? Well, through the Jews were to come two things to help the rest of us. One, from the Jews would come the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior of the world. And secondly, God gave to them the temple. That's why it was set up in Jerusalem, because the temple was going to explain how the Messiah would save the world. That was the purpose of the temple, to help us before the Messiah came to know how he was going to help us. That's the whole purpose of the temple. Well, Israel went down into Egypt, if you know some of the story, and here they were for 400 years. They became slaves of the Egyptians after many years. And finally, God said to Moses, go down to Egypt and bring my people out of Egypt and take them to their own land. So we have what we call the Exodus from Egypt. 1450 BC, they come out of Egypt, the famous story. As they're on their way to, 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 to Palestine or the land of Israel, they come to Sinai Desert. And in the Sinai Desert, there is Mount Sinai. And where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, but he also gave them the plans for the temple. The Moses temple that he was given, the plans, this was to be a movable temple. You could pack it up and carry it on the horse and the camels on your back till the next place where they were going to camp and then set it up again. So it had to be one that could be packed up and carried. When they finally got in Israel, landed there, after many years, they built their first permanent building. This was known as Solomon's Temple. It was built in 950 BC by Solomon. It was destroyed by the, by the Babylonians we saw the other day. Then when they rebuilt their temple, that temple itself was rebuilt by King Herod the Great and that's the temple Jesus came to. So all the temples were built on the same plan, worked the same way no matter which one they were, they were the same structure. Now, these temples all illustrated how God solves the human sin problem, how God can save us from our sin and give us to be part of that last empire that never ends, where there's peace and no pain and so on. Now, there were two critical players in the temple, and we're going to discover those two critical players tonight because when we understand this, then we're going to have a greater picture of how God helps us in our daily lives. The two critical players were, first of all, the animal sacrifices, because animals were sacrificed. You see, these people lived before Jesus even came as a human being, came from heaven to become one of us and then died on the cross. All these people lived way before that. They didn't have an idea what was, all this was about, so God had to teach them through, a, if you like, a drama lesson. And animals were sacrificed morning and night for the people. Now, these lambs that were sacrificed, this brings us to the Dome of the Rock so we can understand. The Dome of the Rock reminds us of a very important story in the Bible or brings us to an important story. The Dome of the Rock, why is it the Dome of the Rock? Because underneath the dome there's a rock. That's pretty smart, isn't it? <laughs> That's why it's called the Dome of the Rock. You can't visit this place today inside unless you're a Muslim. First time I came here, you were able to visit, so I went inside, but they've now closed it up to Muslim, to non-Muslims, so you can't go in there today. But there's a rock under the dome there. You can see it here. And why it's, what's so important about this dome or this rock? Why is it so important? Well, the story of Abraham, when we read the story, one night Abraham is woken up by God and God says to him these words. Notice what God said. He said to him, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I shall tell you of. Now Abraham could hardly believe his ears. God asking him to sacrifice his only son. God never wants human sacrifice. We just talked about it. But Abraham knew the voice of God. God had spoken to him many times. And Abraham knew God's voice. Now Abraham did not want to do this. He had waited years for this boy. He got his son when he was about 90 or 100. But now God says, go and sacrifice that son. Well, Abraham decided to obey God. 
And so he takes his boy with him and they travel together to this mountain. On the way to this mountain, the boy says, Dad, we got the fire, we got the wood, where's the sacrifice? Abraham did not have the heart to tell him at that point that he would be the sacrifice. You can imagine his heart was breaking. This boy, I'm about to kill him. Sacrifice him. Well, they finally get there and he tells him, Isaac, God told me that you're to be the sacrifice today. Evidently, Isaac was an obedient son. I mean, he could have run off like a, like a mountain goat. <laughs> Dad was over 100. <laughs> and Isaac said, right, Dad, if that's what God says, let's get on with it. So Isaac lays down on the wood. The father's about to plunge the knife into his son, lifts it up to plunge it in. You can almost see him bringing it down, and God says, no, Abraham, don't do it. I was just testing you. I just wanted to see, Abraham, do you really love me? Do you love me enough to do what I tell you to do? Do you love me that you keep my commandments? I know you do, Abraham. I could see what you're about to do. Don't do it. I don't need that. If you look behind you, God said, you'll see a ram caught in the bush. Take that ram and take your son off that and take the life of that ram and sacrifice the ram instead. Well, you can imagine Abraham was glad, wasn't he, for that. But that's the place right here is be, believed to be Mount Moriah by the scholars. This is the place where Abraham came to offer up his own son. And the dome of the rock is over this building here is over the place where Solomon built his altar to burn the animals on this is where he set it up right here on this sacred mountain Mount Moriah now you can understand why Ariel Sharon came here now as a Jew this is the place where the temple once stood this is where father Abraham came for the Jews you see the closest place the Jews can get to this place today is that wall you see them come to. You've probably seen them at the wall. They are reading their, their scriptures, rocking backwards and forwards or praying. They leave their prayers in the cracks of those rocks. This is the closest they can come to the temple as a Jew unless you go up on top and you cause some trouble like their prime minister did. So this is why he wanted to come here. This is sacred to the Jews. Why did it upset the Muslims? Because for the Muslims, this is the place where Muhammad is said to have taken a journey on his horse to heaven. So this is sacred to the Muslims. And now this guy comes up and desecrates their temple, if we could put it like, or their, their sacred building. So this is why the problem came. Uh, it's important to both Jews and Muslims, this place. Now, anyway, let's get back to our story. Jehovah Jireh was what Abraham called this place and that word means Jehovah or God Almighty the I am provides the word Mount Moriah or Moriah means seen by the Lord what would God provide what would be seen by the Lord and by people what why was it called this well when Jesus was here he said these words which rather fascinate us. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and he was glad. Now how did Abraham living 2000 odd BC before 2000 years before Jesus or so, how did he see the day of Jesus? Because that's what Jesus said he saw. He saw my day. Let me show you how he saw the day of Jesus. You see, when Abraham was walking up that mountain with his boy on the way to the mountain, remember what he said? Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. Abraham and his boy walked together to the place of sacrifice. And Abraham that day, when it was all over and he, he didn't have to kill his son, he suddenly realized what was going to happen another day. There would be another father and another son who would walk a nearby hill together called Calvary. God the Father and his son would walk to Calvary together, so to speak. But there would be no voice to cry out, God, don't do it! For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's what Abraham saw that day. He realized there was, God was going to give his best for us 
His only begotten Son. That's what the Bible says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That means, for God so loves you. Put your name there. God so loves Tom. God so loves Sally. Put your name there. He gave his only begotten Son. That's why John said these words when he saw Jesus walking toward him at the Jordan River. He said, behold, the Lamb of God. That's God's Lamb. He takes away the sin of the world because he dies for us. Marvelous. Wonderful. Well, that was the first. That was the first player. The sacrifices all pointed to the fact that one day Jesus would give his life for you and I, for the world. Second player were the priests. All of the priests in the temple, especially the high priest, pointed to another person, and that was the same person, Jesus. Because when Jesus died, he rose again, and then he went to heaven, and now he's a priest. That's what the Bible says. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, let us therefore come boldly, that means come confidently, to the throne of grace. Let's pause for a moment. Many people think God is like a great grumpy grandpa up in the sky. He's not. The throne is a throne of what? Grace. The throne of grace. That's the, that's the God who runs this universe. God is a God of grace. We can come confidently to the throne of grace. What for? So that we may obtain mercy. Because there are times when you and I blow it, don't we? We messed up big time. And we get discouraged. In fact, we, we, we kick ourselves and we think, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Well, we can have mercy if we're sincere about it. And God, forgive me. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. But not only forgiveness and mercy, but find grace to help in time of need. There are times when you and I, we want to do that thing that the devil is urging us to do, but if we just stop and say, God, help me, he'll help us. He'll give us strength not to do that thing. That's the other thing Jesus lives for, to forgive us, but also to help us in our time of need. I like the way John, who wrote Revelation, put it. He said, my little children... These things I write to you so that you may not sin. God doesn't want us to sin. However, but he says, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate. That means a, a, an intercessor, a mediator, someone who speaks up for us. Be at the throne of grace, namely Jesus. With the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's the advocate. And he says these words, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We can go direct to God and say, God, I blew it big time. Father, forgive me. And he will forgive us because the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a God. So those priests pointed forward to Jesus. And Jesus is not on a holiday for the last 2,000 years. He's praying for us. He's interceding for us before the throne of grace. What a tremendous thing this is. Anyway, so God places this temple with that drama in the middle of the world. So when an Egyptian comes up and he's going through on his way to Mesopotamia, to Babylon, and he happens to go through Jerusalem, he stops at the temple and looks around and says, what's going on here? And they tell him the story of the gospel about the Savior that's coming one day to die for us. Someone comes from Greece, they go down through Jerusalem, they stop there, what's going on? In fact, some Greeks did do that. They came to the temple and they said, we would see Jesus. Well, they saw Jesus, all right. You see, God wants us to understand, no matter where we come from, how we can be right with God. That's what these things pointed forward to, Jesus, our Savior. Now, the question I want to ask now, as we answer now as we wrap this up tonight is this. Can Christ really forgive my stuff? And some of us have got skeletons in the closet and we still haven't given it up to God. We think it's so bad. We're so ashamed of it. We've done it so many times we can't forgive ourselves. Can God really forgive our sin stuff? And can he really give me victory so that I can have power over that habit that keeps bringing me down? Can he do it? That's the question we need to answer. And tonight we're going to answer that question. And you're going to see, wow, this is amazing. Now we're going to go back to the book of Daniel chapter 9 to do that. And when we finish this tonight again, we're going to do some revision. We were here the other night, first program, Saturday afternoon. 
we're going to do some revision because revision is good for learning so some of it you'll know but some of it we're going to take a little step further tonight okay so are you holding on some more maths before we go home to bed all right <laughs> let's go back to chapter 9 you're going to say wow at the end that's what you need to say remember Israel has sinned Jerusalem's in a mess because of sin stuff the temple's destroyed by the Babylonians the people are captives in Babylon and Daniel realizes it's time to come out of Babylon and he goes to his knees and he's praying about their sin and his sin as a nation and as he comes to the end of his prayer shoom, there is Gabriel he comes down from heaven by the way there's a good lesson for you and I here when you pray God answers he may not answer immediately you get your answer but he answers Daniel prayed and before he'd finished Gabriel was there I don't know how quick he got down from there wherever God lives but down here that's where he was it was pretty quick I reckon he went faster than the speed of light <laughs> all right we won't worry about what that is all right 70 weeks Gabriel said are cut off for your people and for your holy city we started here the other night remember a 70 week period for Israel and Jerusalem Daniel's people Daniel's city let's go on 70 weeks for what we did not answer this question the other day let's look at why was this given 70 weeks are cut off for your people for your holy city now notice what for to finish transgression that word in the Hebrew means rebellion to make an end of sins that means missing the mark in other words to give them victory or power over sin to make reconciliation for iniquity we've been far from God to bring us near to God so we have peace with God to bring in everlasting righteousness to make us right with God and to change us from the inside out to seal up the vision and the prophecy to show us that this prophecy is absolutely rock solid and to anoint the most holy meaning the heavenly temple God's temple all right let's move on the purpose of the 70 weeks let's put it up here number one to end our rebellion against God because we're all rebels at heart when we begin number two to have victory over our sin stuff the evil habits that we have number three to bring us to God to reconcile us so that we have peace with God number four to forgive or to justify or to make us right with God that word justifies an interesting word let me explain it to you quickly had a friend they lived in Northam in Western Australia and these boys when they were little they used to steal milk bottles off the front doors steps of people's homes do you remember some of you the days when the milkman dropped the milk at your door those were the days now you've got to go to the shop but they used to drop the milk bottles on the front door and these these kids would go around and steal the milk bottles and drink it and their dad heard about this and he thought boy if my boys keep stealing they're going to go to jail one day because they'll become crooks and criminals so I don't want that to happen to them so he said I'm going to put the wind up them he said I've got two friends in Northam one is the police officer and the other's the judge so he went to his police officer friend and he said I want you to arrest my boys when they're stealing milk bottles and then he went to the judge and he says I want you to try my boys in your court the police officer will bring them to you so sure enough the boys were caught stealing milk bottles one day and the policeman arrested them those kids were petrified the policeman took them in his van to the courthouse in front of the judge <laughs> and he looked at those boys and he said boys how do you plead guilty your honor because they were caught red-handed with the milk bottles well then he gave them a lecture about if they kept up stealing stuff they'd end up in prison one day because they'd steal cars and then they'd they'd probably hurt someone when they're doing it one day and they'd end up in jail and so he gave them a lecture and then when they'd finished so that they didn't get a, a record a criminal record he said acquitted what does that mean counted as if they never did it in the first place that's the same word as justify God treats you and I as if we never sin he doesn't just forgive us he counts us as if we never did it and he counts Christ's righteousness to us as if it's ours that's a beautiful word so that's what God's doing with us you see that's the purpose of the 70 weeks all right let's move on how's that going to happen let's continue the prophecy he says 
Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah. Aha! Messiah is the solution to the sin problem. It, Messiah is the way to get all that stuff fixed for us so that we're not rebels, so that we're victorious Christians, so that we, 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 we are right with God and so on. Messiah is the solution. That's what he's pointing to. All right. When would he come? Because we need a Messiah like that. When would he come? Well, he's told now. Let's continue on. Now we've got into some revision. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, it's in a mess. Babylonians destroyed it under Nebuchadnezzar. When the command is to restore and rebuild that Jerusalem unto the Messiah, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. What's seven and 62, young people? 69, good on you. Okay, let's do it here. So 70 weeks for Israel and Jerusalem, but he says 69 weeks of those 70 weeks will take us from the time when the command was given to restore and fix that city up until the Messiah, he says, that's going to be 69 weeks. Okay, let's move on a bit further now. When's the starting date? Back there, remember? When's that starting date, the command? We're told in the book of Ezra. Ezra's writing about the Jews coming out of Babylon. He gives us all this information. He gives us decrees that are made. And then he comes to this one. In the seventh year of King Artaxerxes, I issue a decree, says Artaxerxes. Now, notice, we know when the seventh year of Artaxerxes was because we got the records of the Persian kings and Artaxerxes I was a Persian king. We know that his seventh year was four. 5, 7 BC. That's when he made the decree. So we just add 4, 5, 7 plus 69. Well, let's go back here. 69 weeks. Multiply that by 7. How many is that? One. Not quite. Good on you. Right. Okay. Good. 483. Someone's got a lot of fingers and toes down there. All right. 483 prophetic days, right? Now, so that's going to take us to the Messiah from the time of 457 BC. But remember, we talked about this principle the other night. In Bible prophecy, and this is a Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals one literal year. We saw that from Ezekiel and from Moses. We noticed that. Each day, I've laid on you a day for each, sorry, I laid on you a day for each year. One day, one year. All right, so let's come back now. So 457 BC plus 483 years is going to take us to the Messiah. That's what he's telling us. All right, so let's do the sums. 457, we add 483 years. Now remember, this is 457 years before Christ. So as we get closer to Christ, it's less 300 BC, 200 BC. Finally, we get to, let's say, 1 BC. We've still got 28 years to go. So once we cross over, now it's 1 AD, 2 AD, 3 AD, we get to 27 AD. Got the idea? So all you need to do is take 457 from 483, and you'll end up with 27. All right, you do that when you go home. Now, what happened in 27 AD? That's the question. We saw this the other night. Let's read from Luke now. Luke is such a pain in the neck almost sometimes. He has all these details which we sometimes say, who cares about that stuff? Well, let me tell you, when the scholars look at that, they really see why he put it there. It's not there for fun. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, we know that when he began to reign, that king of Rome, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass, Jesus also was baptized, and while he prayed, the heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended or came down in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. Wow, that's a beautiful thing. All right, so let's notice here something interesting here. When Luke, who wrote the book of Luke, also wrote the book of Acts, he, re he repeated this and he said, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. 
When he was anointed, when the dove came on him, and that was the Holy Spirit, that means he was anointed with the Holy Spirit. But when was it? At his baptism. When was his baptism? 27 AD. Now, the Greek word for anointed is the word Christos or Christ. The Hebrew word, the Israeli word, is Messiah or Messiah. And both of those words mean the anointed one. Now in the 15th year of Tiberius' reign, we know when that was, 27 AD. As we said the other night, this is unbelievable. Daniel told us way down here, 500 years before it happened, that the Messiah is going to be anointed in 27 AD and he got it dead right. Someone told him something. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing what's going on here. So Messiah appears. Jesus becomes the Christ. Jesus Christos. That's why Jesus said, we saw the other night, when he started his work after his baptism, he said, the time is fulfilled. I have arrived on time, Daniel's time. That's why he said those words. Now, how would he solve the sin problem? He's here now. He's arrived in 27 AD. How's he going to solve our problem? Wow, now we come back to the prophecy. Question, if we've had 69 weeks and there's 70 weeks in all, how many are left? One. Marvellous. You're all awake that you didn't go to sleep on that food stuff. Good. One week's left, isn't it? Jesus has arrived. There's one week left. Now let's see what happens. That's going to take us to 34 AD if you add seven years because one week is how many days? Seven days and one day for a year. So seven years. Notice what the Bible says. Daniel continues. After the 62 weeks, that means he said seven weeks and 62 weeks. So really it's after the seven which came first and now the 62. So after the 69, he's really saying that. After the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. He'll be killed. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of that week, in the middle of that last seven years, he shall bring an end to sacrifices and offerings. Now, what does this mean? An end to sacrifices and offerings. You will remember, where were the sacrifices and offerings made? In the temple, right. What happened when Jesus died on that good, bad Friday? Remember what happened? John, Matthew tells us that the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Let's read it. Then, when he died, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Not from the bottom to the top by a human hand. It must have been an angelic hand that ripped that curtain in two. Why? Because now we have access to God. Now there was no longer any need for animal sacrifices because the real one had just happened on the cross. All those animals pointed forward to this great day when the Messiah, God in human flesh, would die. Now it had happened. So now there's no need for animal sacrifices or earthly priests because the real one had now arrived. That's what the Bible is telling us. Okay. The laws of sacrifices and offerings ended at the cross because we don't need it anymore, don't need an animal, don't need these priestly offerings of, of their, 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 their food offerings and drink offerings. The real has arrived. So now we go back to Daniel chapter 9. Let's notice. After 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifices and offerings. Now think about this last seven-year period. It begins in 27 AD when Jesus is baptized. In the middle of that seven-year period, that's 31 AD. When you read the New Testament, there are four Passovers. Jesus dies right on time in 31 AD. I could have told you that 500 years ago, said Daniel. See the point? Daniel told us that. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus died on time, right on time. You see the... 
Bible is absolutely precise. The 70 weeks or the 490 years are rock solid. In 27 AD, Jesus was baptized. In 31 AD, he died. In 34 AD, that's when Stephen was stoned in the book of Acts. And the, Jew, the Christians had to run away from Jerusalem and they ran to the, where the Gentiles lived and started to share it with them. In that time, Paul was converted and he became the, 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 the preacher, if you like, to the non-Jewish people. You see, the 490 years for Israel as their special people in terms of spreading the gospel had come to an end. They failed. Now God gives it to other people. Non-Jews must also be brought in. Still, the Jews are God's people as well, of course, but they need to believe in Jesus like anyone else in order to have salvation. Now, the question is, so what? Why did God tell us all that stuff? Why did Daniel predict that through Gabriel 500 years before Jesus came? What's the point? This is the so what. Jesus is the Messiah, first of all. We saw the other night. He's God in human flesh because he is the Messiah. He fulfills the prophecy. But secondly, this. Remember what this prophecy was all about? What Messiah would do? He would end your rebellion and mine against God. When you see Jesus lifted up on a cross and you really think about that, really think about that, that he died for your place, your rebel heart is broken, my rebel heart is broken. How can I spit in the face of God who would die for me like that? How can I go and sin so lightly when Jesus died for me? That's what happens, you see. We can have victory over sin and wrong because of what Jesus did. We can be reconciled to God. We can be forgiven. We can be right with God. In other words, all of that is absolutely true. Why? Because the prophecy proves it. He did come on time. He did die on time. Absolutely. Therefore, the rest is true. That's what God is trying to get across to us. That is yours. And you should know that for sure because the prophecy proves it. Shows us it's rock solid. That's what it's all about. Now that's called the new covenant, by the way. Let's finish off now. This is the covenant we read in our first session that I will make, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and I will write them in their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. What a thing that is to be a child of God. All of them shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. God will be merciful to your sin tonight. He will forgive your sin no matter how deep and how many times you've done it. That's his promise. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Forgiven by our great God. Now that's the covenant we just read. That's exactly what Gabriel was talking about and it was confirmed. What did it say? After 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off. Then he shall confirm a covenant with them for one week. In other words, in that last, the new covenant. That's what that is, my friends. That's why you can go out of here tonight on cloud 99. <laughs> because you can know that all of that is yours. Because God has proved it, if you like, to you. How can we have it as we close? Notice what the Bible says. Now may the God of peace, through the blood or the death of Jesus, the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will. That's what God does, and he does it through the death of Jesus Christ. My friend, tonight, you need to lean on Jesus. You need to throw yourself on Christ. He can give you forgiveness he can justify you treat you as if you never sinned he can give you power over sin he can bring you to the heart of God he is the one who does it I want to close with this story John Patton was the missionary to the people of Vanuatu one of the missionaries great man of God this man and he was translating the Bible into the language of the people of Vanuatu but he couldn't find the right word to use for them so that they would understand the word faith or belief. He racked his brains, he searched to find out how can they understand this idea of faith or belief or trust. And one day he came and visited a friend and his friend was lying out in the Pacific sun. I tell you what, it's beautiful out there in the Pacific. You ever go there, you need to stay there. 
And, you know, Fiji, Vanuatu, where's Papua New Guinea? It's all good, isn't it? <laughs> no wonder those people are so nice. It's so sunny. Anyway, he's lying out there in the sun and he's soaking it all up and he's enjoying it. And Mr. Patton showed up and he said, what are you doing, man? He said, oh, Mr. Patton, I'm just reclining. And Patton said, I've got my word. I've got my word. And when he translated the Bible for the people of Vanuatu, he wrote it like this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever reclines all their weight on him will not perish. My friend tonight, are you reclining your weight on Jesus? Are you leaning on him and saying, Lord, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. I have nothing, I can do nothing. But Jesus, you did it for me and I claim Christ. The moment you do that, the moment you're forgiven. The moment God writes his laws in your heart, that moment you're a new person. The moment you do that, he gives you a power and he makes you his child, his son, his daughter. Let's pray together. Oh, God and Father, tonight, thank you for these prophecies. We may not understand them all, but we can say, wow, what a God. It's all true. Daniel predicted this stuff. 500 years before Jesus came, 2,500 years ago, so we can know tonight that we are your children, that we are forgiven if we just lean and recline all our weight on Jesus. Lord, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and you like to say, Lord, I'm just leaning on you, Lord. You know my life, you know my sin stuff, but Jesus, I claim you tonight. Just raise your hand if you like to say, Christ, I'm going to put my life in your hand tonight. I'm going to lean my weight on you. Please help me because I need you. Father, you see our hands. Thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your kindness. Bless us as we go to our homes now. Keep us in your care. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for being with us tonight. It's amazing what the prophecies we have. Remember that... Uh, on Saturday afternoon, we'll be back here, The Omen, uh, Egypt and the Book of the Dead. Now, um, tonight as you leave, you'll get some resumes. Um, Pastor Zenny, just for a moment. I have given you the wrong resume tonight, number six. That's called The Omen. That's for next Friday, so you need to not give that one out, okay? You give number five out tonight, the one on the sanctuary. I think I've given you the wrong one. I'm pretty sure of that. That's my fault. Sorry, folks. We'll give that to you next Friday, okay? The sanctuary one, the one on the temple. It's my humble apologies for that. I've given you the wrong one. The Omen, Egypt, and the Book of the Dead. Next Friday night. Don't miss this program. I tell you what, these two programs, you're going to be amazed at what we discover in the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation and other parts of the Bible. Then on Sunday... Wait on. That's wrong, isn't it? You know, I blow on it here. Sorry. The devil made me do that. Right. <laughs> that should be when? Saturday, 2 o'clock. Okay, that's Saturday, 2 o'clock, because that's the other group over in 8 Mile Plain. So if you come on Friday night here, you're going to be on your own, and you'll have to preach the sermon. All right? So don't come here on Friday night, will you? You come on Saturday at 2 o'clock. Then you'll come on Sunday at 2 o'clock, right? And you'll hear the Antichrist. Antichrist's 2 o'clock Sunday. That's wrong. And the next one's going to be wrong for sure because it should be Monday night. Next Monday week, we're going to go to Israel in the end times, the new world order. So make sure you get a copy of the programs to come and you get all the dates and the times right. You won't get confused by me, okay? As you leave. See you on Saturday afternoon, 2 o'clock. Good. <laughs>